Please do join us in our third instalment um, of our youth mini webinar series, Seen But Still Not Heard Voices on the Youth Climate Movement. So just to begin, uh, for the people that are new to this webinar series that haven't joined our previous two events, my name is Robbie um, and I'm the School and Youth Outreach Officer at Hope for the Future. And I lead on our engagement with young people and teachers um, across the UK. So this week we've had well over 100 sign-ups and we've had some really dynamic um, and interesting discussions already and I'm equally looking forward to this event. Um, so just to give a quick overview as to who Hope for the Future is. Hope for the Future is a UK-wide climate communications charity um, that works to equip communities, individuals, um, all across the country to help them communicate the urgency of climate change to their politicians, both at a local and national levels of government. And we feel that, you know, engaging with elected representatives is vitally important and that constituents have the opportunity um, to have challenging and rich conversations with their elected officials, especially right now as we consider how best to build back better um, and ensure that the economic recovery um, that, that, we, that we go on um, following the COVID crisis aligns to our uh, path to reaching net zero by 2050, um, if not much hopefully earlier. Um, and, you know, we believe that local grassroots democratic engagement is a key part of achieving this. So this is the um, fourth instalment of our over, um, wider webinar series, Common Home, Common Ground. Um, and we'd like to thank the European Climate Foundation uh, for funding our events project, which has allowed us to bring you this webinar series. Um, and I would personally like to thank um, the Old Foundation and ECF again for their continued financial support um, with, our youth, with our youth outreach work. So just a quick bit of housekeeping then before we start. Uh, firstly, this webinar will be being recorded. So it will be available on demand to watch and share. Um, and we'll be sending all of our attendees a follow-up email um, at the end of the week, directing you to further resources, webinars like this, and instructions on how to get both involved in our work further um, and the wonderful work of our great panelists who are here today. Um, so in today's um, webinar then, you can get involved by posting your questions in the Q&A box, which is located just at the bottom of the screen. Um, and I'll be, I'll be monitoring this um, and putting these questions to our panelists later on in the session. Um, and then just to add, please do follow us on social media, especially Twitter. Um, our handle is at HopeFTFuture. Um, and you can use the hashtag, hashtag HFTFWebinar, our hashtag Common Home or both. It's completely up to you. Um, just to ensure that the conversations that we have in this webinar extend beyond just this space um, and that the involvement is as wide as possible. Um, so also on your dashboard, you'll see a little chat box, which is also at the bottom of the screen. Uh, please use this as a space to sort of introduce yourself um, and discuss ideas with other attendees on the webinar. Um, and then my colleague George will be on hand answering any sort of non-related webinar questions that you might have regarding hope for the future. Um, and then finally, this is a really important point, um, the feedback form, um, form will pop up on your screen. Um, at the end of the webinar um, and please do if you can take the time to do this um, it's only short and it's a huge huge help um, in, in evaluating um, our sort of events projects and ensuring that they're the best that they can be um, so today then we're going to be looking at building back better and how we can ensure that the climate movement um, is a diverse and inclusive space for all um, and this is a really really important sort of topic um, you know at the moment and always um, and this this the idea behind this webinar was really, really inspired by um, Chini, um, who attended our Edinburgh event last year on a similar sort of topic. Um, and then we've got some great panelists, Maya Rose and Vanessa, who um, Chini will um, introduce in a second. So Chini, if I pass over to you to um, make some opening remarks and introduce our panelists, um, then that would be really, really great. So over to you, Chini. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us and thank you um, guys for having me. Um, it's, it was really great and inspiring to speak um, to Hope for the Future uh, in Edinburgh a few months ago, uh, quite a while ago, um, and to see how the conversations have moved on since then. So I'm going to speak for a few minutes before introducing Maya Rose and Vanessa. Um, I'm going to speak on how it is, how can we build a climate movement that speaks for everyone. The past few weeks have we've seen a lot of protest and conversation about race, obviously. And as we think about the history of those who fought for racial justice over the centuries and over recent decades, um, which names stands out as one of the moral figures who opposed it? In the UK context, we think a lot about William Wilberforce. 
But we know, of course, that it would be a nonsense to suggest that Wilberforce dismantled the structural multi-billion pound global industry of the transatlantic slave trade all by himself. Um, there must have been others. Um, who were they? Whose names do we include in the history books? And who is there that we might be forgetting? Who is not being drawn into the conversation? Now, when we think about climate justice and the climate movement, when the history books are written about those who worked for climate justice, who do you think will be the poster girl? Of course, um, at the moment, it will be Greta, Greta Thunberg. She's become a global sensation, a real example of a young person who is speaking truth to power, who, who is speaking passionately and fiercely and without fear. And she has, without a doubt, helped to make the issue of climate change uh, more urgent and more accessible. And she's a girl of influence with millions of followers on social media. And she has done an amazing job. But she is not the only one. Nor is she representative of all those who care about climate justice and the environment around the world. The climate movement must become more diverse. We need to widen participation, not just because it looks good in photos, but because the movement needs all of us. It's critical for an authentic an impactful campaign that really makes a difference in our world. I believe the climate movement needs to be younger and more full of colour. Black and brown people and young people are already activists who are extremely passionate and active in the area of bringing attention to the climate emergency. I'm really um, excited to speak to the two young women that we have with us today. Young, uh, young people and black and brown people are fiercely fighting for the protection of their own communities um, because they have seen with their own eyes the devastating effects of climate emergency. And they're also crying out for the voices of those who are being affected by climate change now to be heard in the current discourse. We know that the climate crisis is having devastating effects on our planet and its people. But the reality is that it's the people of the global south or the global majority and um, those with black and brown faces who are mostly affected. Yet they are largely absent from the images we see of those trying to bring about change. How do we raise up the diverse voices of those who have been crying out for change for decades? And how do we raise up the diverse voices of those younger people who are crying out for change for their future? How do we ensure that the climate movement is an inclusive one in which the dignity of all people is recognised and valued? Martin Luther King once said in letters from a Birmingham jail that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. We must hear the voices of those who are affected, whether it's their by their current circumstances or whether it's their futures that are being eroded. It's a reminder to me that we must start with centering their stories instead of those who, while we may ultimately all face the effects of climate change, those who have caused the problems are the ones who seem to be um, at the forefront. We must hear the demands of the oppressed, those most affected by climate change right now, and not just in some distant future. And it's those people that we need to put at the centre of the story. Climate change is making life even more difficult for some of the world's poorest and most marginalised communities now, today. It's having a devastating impact on every area of life, from basic needs such as food and shelter, to issues such as education and women's rights. The pervasive impact on everyone, and in particular those in the communities in which Christian aid works in the Global South, uh, means we can no longer ignore it. Um, we're all in this together. The climate emergency requires some of the hardest communities, um, hardest hit communities to change and adapt in order to survive. Um, our emissions in the West and Global North are their drought. 
so we can't sit back and let them face the full force of climate change alone. So time is now for each of us to stand together for the flourishing of all humanity. But we have to recognise that we can't just create movements uh, for climate change and climate justice um, that look monochrome or look uh, like they're speaking with one voice uh, that is having the same experience. We can't create those and then expect others to just join in because we want our pictures to be more diverse. Diversity needs to be included right at the start of movements um, such as um, Extinction Rebellion or any new movements that start. I'm really hopeful about the future. Um, today's conversation um, is one of the things that makes me hopeful. Um, but last year, I, I went on my first ever protest um, because I was so moved to action, particularly when thinking about the future for my son, who is two and a half, um, and I took him along to the Mothers Rise Up March in central London. And there were thousands of people at this march. I didn't see many people who looked like me. I didn't see many mothers who were um, people of colour or from black and minority ethnic backgrounds. Now, obviously, I know that people like me, uh, black people, are being drawn to speak up about the devastating effects of climate change on our children's futures. But why is it that we don't necessarily see those faces um, when we um, think of what the climate movement um, consists of now? Christian Aid, um, which is the international development organisation I work for, is about to undertake the biggest re piece of research of its kind into black Christians and their perspective on climate change and climate justice. We're also going to be asking them what, what the barriers are to them entering the movement. We believe that it's really important that we include the voices of all people from all ages and backgrounds and walks of life in what is the most important issue of our age. So I realised that maybe I was supposed to introduce myself. <laughs> um, so I am Chilly McDonald. I'm Head of Community Fundraising and Public Engagement at Christian Aid, which is an international development organisation. Prior to that, I led the media and PR team. I worked at World Vision, another um, uh, international development organisation, and the Evangelical Alliance. I was also involved in setting up something called ThreadsUK.com, which was an online collective of people in their 20s and 30s exploring um, faith and life. Um, and I also study theology and religious studies at Cambridge University. I regularly um, speak on issues of race and gender um, in the media, including um, BBC Radio 4's uh, Thought for Day Today programme. But on to the main event. Um, I'm really excited to introduce to you, first of all, Maya Rose Cray. Maya Rose is 17 and a prominent naturalist passionate about birds and saving our planet. She is the youngest person to see half the world's birds, having seen 5,396 in seven continents and writes the high profile Bird Girl blog with over 4 million views. As president of Black to Nature, she is the youngest person to be awarded an honorary doctorate of science, fighting for access to nature for minority ethnic children, organizing nature camps and conferences. Maya Rose, you are amazing. Uh, Vanessa Nakate is a climate activist from Uganda. She was the first Fridays for Future climate activist in Uganda, and she founded the Rise Up Climate Movement to amplify the voices of activists from Africa. Her work includes raising awareness to the danger of climate change, the causes and the impacts. And she spearheaded the campaign Save Congo Rainforest, which later spread to several other countries. She's currently working on a project that involves installation of solar and institutional stoves in schools. Vanessa, you are also outstanding. Um, so welcome to both of you and thank you for being part of this webinar series. So to begin with, um, both Maya Rose and Vanessa are going to start with their um, uh, uh, reflections for a few minutes. So I'm going to, to begin with, I'm going to hand over to Maya Rose. Um, hi, yeah, thank you so much for having me on today. And I think, um, yeah, I think this title is of the webinar is amazing. It's, it's exactly the sort of conversations that we, well, that we should have been having years ago, but that really sorely need to be happening at the moment. And um, 
for me, my relationship with nature is a lot longer than my relationship with the climate change movement. I've been going out bird watching and going into nature since I was a baby. And um, I love it. I love the outdoors and I love the environment. But um, I was the only person that looked like me, except my mum and my sister, um, going out into the countryside and into the outdoors. Um, and I'm half Bangladeshi and um, everyone around me was white pretty much. And I, find, I found that quite upsetting growing up, um, which is why when I was 14, I set up my organisation Black's Nature, which is all about um, diversifying the countryside, but also giving like minority ethnic kids from inner city Bristol the opportunity to go out into the countryside and really forge that connection. Because for me, it's really important, not just for the sake of, you know, getting people to love nature for the sake of the movement and for the sake of trying to um, save something that they've grown to love and know, but also for the sake of the kids that we work with, where um, they're missing something that's really significant in human life and that is so important in terms of our mental and our physical well-being and um, all of our lifestyles, to be honest. Um, so I've been doing that type of work for years now and um, that's kind of what led me into um, working with the climate change movement and I think because there's been such a long history of a very certain type of person at least in the UK um, having been part of environmental movements where it's people that are liberal but very white and very middle class um, the, if they're not the only ones in the, in the movement, then they're the ones with the loudest voices and they're the ones deciding um, the future actions and how issues are going to be handled and um, what sustainability means to them. And I think, um, you know, um, we're, we're missing out on massive swathes of the population. We're missing out on their voice, on their views and their voices and their points of um, perspective. Like, so, in, even though, so I'm from Bristol and there 38% of the children in schools are minority ethnic. But when you're going into London, that number goes up to 85% in some of the schools. You know, it's not, um, it's not tiny numbers. And um, I suppose I just feel like um, the fact that the movement continues to be, for the most part, very homogenous could be its downfall because if you're not engaging with entire communities of people it's creating a movement that isn't sustainable and but as well as that i think um because for the most part the movement has been spearheaded by the west and by white people in the west um there's a very um skewed point of view when it comes to social justice and the responsibility of the climate change movement where um you know, it's almost placing the importance of environmentalism over um, people and human rights and the, um, pe yeah, people's lives, I suppose. And um, again, I think this comes from like a very small pool of perspectives. But the example I like to use a lot because my family is Bangladeshi is that we rely heavily on the garment industry in Asia and um, when people are calling for you to stop buying fast fashion and to buy sustainably and to buy into a circular economy, there's never any mention of all the hundreds of thousands of people that are going to lose their livelihoods, and their income, um, and aren't going to have anywhere to turn. And I think um, that's another thing that could make the movement very unsustainable in the long term, because if you're not thinking about the human impact of your actions, it doesn't work. Um, but again, in Bangladesh, there is a um, youth climate movement. And I think uh, for, for me, I find it really inspirational that in um, places like that, where it's seen as quite like taboo for young people to raise up their voices above the adults and tell them what to do, that people still feel so strongly about these issues um, that they're fighting to create change. Um, and I suppose, yeah, it's, for me, it's the fact that um, people are only just starting to realise that it's people in the global south that are already taking the brunt of the impact of climate change, but are having very minimal input into what to do to stop this change. 
um, and the fact that they're taking brunt essentially, the brunt of essentially what is the mistakes of the global north from places like the UK and America. And um, I suppose my hope for the future is that um, this is going to change and it's going to become a lot more sustainable and a lot more um, diverse and open, willing to listen. And we're going to be able to stop things like food shortages and climate refugee crisis, uh, crises and, um, you know, all the things in between. And um, I suppose finally, <laughs> sorry, um, I'm also the ambassador for Survival International. Um, which does a lot of work to do with Indigenous people's rights and the conservation movement. And I think, again, it's another example of people's voices not being heard because um, these are the people that have been maintaining and really caring for their land for hundreds of thousands of years. But because there's such a um, white Western perspective of what conservation is and what it looks like, people um, quite often push their voices to the side and aren't willing to listen. And um, one um, campaigner from the Ecuadorian Amazon was saying that only together can we face these global challenges. Why should we allow mining when reparation is impossible? Please help us to amplify our voices. Please help us to save our rivers, our jungle, our home. And I believe that's how we can do the best job that we possibly can by, t by listening to everyone and um, creating a sustainable climate change movement. Brilliant. Thank you so much. There's so much in there that we can kind of potentially dig into later. Um, remember uh, that everyone that you can post your um, questions in the Q&A chat. Um, I'll now move on to Vanessa for her opening reflections. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad to to be part of this and, you know, to really think about and talk about the hope and you know just try and search for that hope that can make us imagine a better future because i believe that um before you you know you have that hope then it starts with the imagination of the kind of future that you want and um as a person of course there, there are very many things that i hope to see in the future and i really hope that many others can be able to see these things. When I became an activist, um, honestly, I thought I'd be doing it for just um, a few months because I had just um, finished school and I just had like a few months uh, before my graduation. So I just wanted to, you know, use that time and probably do something that could help out people in one way or another in my community. And I never really expected uh, to be in the climate movement this deep, or I never expected to be in the climate movement in the first place, because I tried to, you know, look for the problems and the challenges that the people faced in, you know, the different parts of my country. And the truth is, I was so, so surprised to find that climate change was one of those problems. Um, our schools lack so much in educating uh, the students, uh, the children about the issue of the environment. I mean, it's, uh, it's a topic that they just literally sweep over and they never really go into the details. So as a young person, I was really surprised to find that climate change was one of those problems. And, you know, I had seen so much of uh, news talking about landslides, floods in my country, and uh, rivers uh, flooding, lakes, water levels rising up. And I had never really connected all this to climate change uh, simply because of the education that I received and that is why in my activism, I talk so much about um, climate education, especially in the primary schools and the secondary schools. So when I decided to read more about climate change and you know, realizing all these impacts and all these causes, I, I, it really, really, it became so personal to me 
to to know that the people in my country were facing some of these disasters you know literally like every part of the country for example the northern part of the country you know being faced with increasing uh temperatures and heavy dry spells and thinking about the western part of the country being affected by continuous floods and uh, the eastern part of the country being affected by landslides and the central part of the country being affected by floods because of the rise in uh, the water levels of Lake Victoria. So when I realized that this was actually a crisis that we did not we didn't know about i decided that i could be a voice and you know try and you know make some change in my country in my community for that period of time before uh, my graduation because i realized that climate change uh, was greatly threatening the food availability for the people in my country and also the access to clean water for the people in my country. Because when it floods, still the water is contaminated because when houses are submerged, even the toilets are submerged and uh, the water that is used by, you know, the people in those communities is contaminated and many of their children are put to a point of uh, getting diseases like cholera, diarrhea and, when there is a drought still there is a uh, water scarcity because the wells are going to dry up the small streams are going to dry up so you realize that with with every challenge that comes with climate change be it the landslides uh, people will still be left with no water be it the floods people won't have access to clean water for their domestic use uh, when you think about the droughts then they won't have access to water at all and uh, many of them will have to struggle to walk long distances and you know this affects uh, the women the most because i come from a country whereby you know, it is the women that take care of most of the house chores that make sure that there is food and there is water in the house. And when you think about how these women have to walk very long distances to get water for their families, it is very, very devastating. Because I went from a point of not just looking at the primary effects that we see, that is the flooding, the droughts, the landslides, among others, but then to also understand the secondary effects that, you know, people many times overlook, you know, what happens to a community after experiencing a climate disaster. Many people never going to understand how the women are going to be affected and the increase of the gender inequalities in those communities, how some of the girls are going to be given up for marriage because their families cannot afford to take care of all the children anymore, how some, some students will have to stop going to school because the money that was taking care of the expenses was coming from the crops that their parents were growing. Looking at all this, I realized that this was a crisis that was being underlooked and undermined and not giving attention simply because the people that are affected the most are those in the rural communities and they literally have no voice. So understanding all this uh, made me uh, to stop thinking about doing this for just months, but to actually do it and until I see you know, the solutions, until I see a better world, until I see a better future for the people. Really my hope for the future is to see that people can have access you know, to their basic needs. You know? There are very many people who are living very luxurious lives and you know, uh, these things don't seem so important to them because you know, they have easy access. So my hope is for for the vulnerable people to stop being vulnerable and for people to stop being continuously pushed into extreme poverty because we won't be able to eradicate poverty without addressing the issues that are pushing people into poverty. Some of these families build from their farms, they build from, you know, 
the crops that they grow. But then with every disaster that happens, they're taken back to zero. So I really hope that we can have a world where people have basic needs like food and they don't have to struggle to get it. People have uh, basic needs like water, health facilities. And the only way that we can have these things is by building resilience in these communities because Yes, uh, we are seeing some of the climate action plans that are being put in place. But what about the person who is suffering now? Are we going to wait for 2050 to, to see solutions? And yet people are suffering and, you know, dying right now. So I think now is the time to, you know, bring hope in these people's lives by bringing resilience in their communities in that if they face a, a drought situation, they still have access to water through water harvesting mechanisms in their communities. If they, if they face a food scarcity, they have food storage systems that can help them, you know, recover and be able to you know, just move forward in, in, the, in that situation and build back better and recover from that disaster. That is what I hope to see. And uh, this I know will ensure that we are not only fighting for the planet, but we are also fighting for the people. Because if we fight for the planet and we don't fight for, for the lives of the people in this planet, then, um, I mean, who will who will be left you know who will be left to you know take care of the planet and to live on this planet so i think uh protecting people and protecting the planet plus protecting the wildlife they are all uh interconnected in a way and we cannot protect the planet without ensuring that the people are okay and we cannot protect the planet without ensuring that the wildlife is okay so the three of them you know they move hand in hand the ecosystems the people the planet that is the hope you know that i have for the future and i hope that i can be able to see this in our communities especially those that are most affected by the climate crisis thank you Oh, thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to start off the conversation with a couple of um, questions for you both before moving on to the Q&A. Um, I want to ask, so looking at the current kind of the narrative of climate change campaigns, um, how would you say that they specifically exclude those from, I guess, more diverse or less privileged backgrounds? What are the things that you do when you see those campaigns, for example, and you think, oh, why are they, why, why is that the narrative? I'm um, starting with Maya Rose. Okay. Um, I think there's like a few different things. And again, this might be a bit like UK centric, but I feel like um, something that excludes a lot of the communities here is, um, again, just this narrative of, um, what an environmental campaigner is supposed to look like and who they're supposed to be. And um, I think, <laughs> like, you know, it's, um, it's, it's the same thing of being very middle class and white and having enough time and resources to put a lot of yourself into the campaign work that you're doing, um, which um, I think ends up with very, like certain types of campaigns while other issues are massively ignored here um but on a more global scale scale i think um a narrative that really irritates me quite a lot is when people talk all the time about um all the pollution that china and india go off um and all, how they're so terrible for the environment without acknowledging the fact that um they're some of the hubs in the world that are massively industrial and creating loads and loads of our stuff basically for the west and actually thinking about how if you took away all of the pollution that's caused by things that we're buying and things that we're consuming um how bad these countries actually are because at the end of the day i feel like um it's very easy again to give the blame to other people and pretend that um, other like Western countries are doing really well and we're so much better and we've progressed past that point 
when at the end of the day we're still consuming the same amount of things or more and we're still causing the same amount of pollution even if um we're not like physically making it ourselves anymore thank you and i and I, i'm really interested then vanessa on, on your perspective because you obviously um active on the global scale but also within uganda so what um, I guess, what's it like to be um, a climate activist within, within Uganda? What's the, what is the narrative and how um, does that potentially portray certain messages? Um, well, being an activist in, in Uganda, of course, uh, in my own country, climate change is not really an issue that, you know, uh, bothers everyone. I would say that those who seem to be interested in the climate uh, issues are those uh, maybe who are working with those organizations that are working towards a better environment or those who probably did studies, uh, maybe environmental studies or climate related studies. But then the, the outside, um, outside the climate studies, outside the climate organizations, really the youth are not um, so involved in the, in the climate movement. And I honestly understand them because I personally didn't know much about nature environment until uh, 2018 when I was doing my own research. So it really takes a person to decide to do this kind of research so that they can educate themselves about what is really happening in the world. So what we are taught in schools um, feels so far away from the reality of what is happening. So I think that's, uh, that really pulls the youth or the, the teenagers away from the conversation of climate change. And then the fact that um, many people have very many daily needs that they hope to you know fulfill so i mean they're so focused on uh, fulfilling their current maybe family needs or uh, the needs from their jobs or their workplaces literally so there is really no much conversation when it comes to the climate issues except among the activists that are doing the activism and uh, i would say being an activist an activist from Uganda on the global scale. Um, wow, how does it feel? <laughs> I think it really feels strange. I don't know, lack of a better word, because there is always that feeling of, I mean, you're not saying enough or you're not doing much. And it's not because uh, I am not doing much or any other activist is not doing much. I think it's because of the system that has been, you know, built and the narrative around uh, every other movement, including the climate movement. So I think there is a certain sort of uh, Western saviorism that really pushes other communities that don't come from the Western, you know, part of the world to feel like um, intimidated in a way and to feel like they have to you know, put too much on the table so that they can know that, okay, you are doing something. That is uh, a narrative that I really, really don't like in, uh, in the climate movement because it really pushes uh, activists uh, from the global south to the point of doing so much just to tell their stories they literally do triple the work that the rest of the activists are doing. Because at the end of the day, the society or the system that we are living in right now does not uh, uphold or uplift their voices at the, as they ought to be lifted. Thank you. I wonder whether um, whoever wants to answer this first can, can but I wonder, is there a difference between um, the youth climate movement? Um, do you think that, that the youth climate movement is, is leading the way in terms of diversity and being more inclusive? Or is it the same issues being perpetuated among the younger generations as with the older ones? I don't no mind. Is. Okay. Um, I think um, it's somewhere in between, per like from my personal experience, where um, 
you know, the youth movement isn't perfect at all. <laughs> and it hasn't um, maybe caught up with the times and it isn't as diverse as it should be. But it's not um, as, you know, monoethnic, as monocultural as the movements were before. And I think partially because of um, the internet and social media, it is um, much easier to hear from a larger range of people than it ever would, been be would have been before. And I think um, for me, that's the best part. That's the part that's changing the most where actually um, before it would have been like a, a relatively small circle of people that were from your area and from your community and people you were probably friends with outside of activism. Now it's these massive like global communities at, where people are very ready to have um, quite uncomfortable conversations about um, race and activism and conservation. And um, I think for me, even though it's not great at the moment, for me, it feels like there's therefore a lot of potential for the future for things to be um, for thing for things to be better, for things to be good, I suppose. Any more to add, Vanessa? Well, um, I think that the, the youth movement tries to be um, as inclusive as possible. But then uh, the problem sometimes really comes from from the outside and you know those who are I would say those who are much older because of the system that I already talked about that really intimidates the other activists, especially from the global south. And um, as Myers has said, social media has really played a very, very big role in you know, helping us recognize different voices from different parts of the world. Because if it wasn't for social media, trust me, uh, the climate movement would be um, dubbed to be one that is completely white, I would say that. But because of social media, we can see activists from, you know, Asia, we can see activists from Africa, and I've, I'm really thankful to social media for that. And um, for the youth climate movement, I have interacted with some of the young people in it, and yeah, some of them have been uh, really inclusive and really, really supportive. So I think the problem comes from out and that needs to be worked on. And I mean, it all starts from the system changing because we need to break all these systems that promote white saviorism. Because if we continuously uphold such systems, then uh, those uh, who are marginalized they will continuously feel intimidated. They will continuously feel left out. They'll continuously feel like they have to do so much just to tell their story. Sorry, I was trying to write down what you said then. Um, I, I want to stick with, with what you were just talking about and social media, because there's a question that, um, that came in, which is around how can we ensure that the media includes all perspectives? Now, Vanessa, you've obviously had interesting um, experience of that. So what would you say that the media would need to do to make um, the movement uh, reflect the diversity of the movement? Well, um, first of all, media needs to understand that the movement is as diverse as possible. And um, sometimes I really wonder if media cares about us getting climate action or it actually cares about selling the news you know and yes this truth had so much but i think that uh, when it comes to the activists from the global south because to me they are the least hard when it comes to those activists i think to media we are not um what i would call selling cake to them you know I feel like we are not, uh, if we made the headlines, uh, we wouldn't make them as, uh, bring them more traffic as they expected. I've seen this uh, in different, different kinds of media. When the headline is for an activist of color and then an activist from the Western community, the engagement is stronger from, you know, the Western community. So that really makes me realize that, um, we activists from the global south and the, the the rest of the activists that are doing all this amazing work we are not really selling cake 
to the media. So it makes me question whether the media actually wants climate justice for us or it wants some quick um, traffic for themselves. So media needs to understand that the climate movement is diverse. There are different voices. And as I usually say, every activist has a story to tell and every story has a solution to give and every solution has a life to change. So media needs to step up their game and give people the opportunity to tell their stories, to give their solutions and to bring change in their communities because media doesn't understand what really happens on the ground. Most of the time they only have the statistics of what happens um, maybe in the African communities. But these activists in these communities clearly understand what the people are going through. They understand every detail of the consequence or the impact of the climate crisis. So media needs to step up their game and be more diverse because we cannot, you know, we cannot achieve climate justice without including everyone. Thank you. We've got a few questions um, and about 10 minutes or so. So I'm going to kind of try and rattle through a few. Um, uh, first of all, um, what uh, the question that came in that says, what inspires and drives you to continue your activism, particularly when feeling frustrated with the climate movement itself? Uh, Maya Rose, you, you we are both such, um, I guess, such strong and positive, ultimately, voices. How do you, how do you keep going? Um, I think for me, it's partially out of like pure stubbornness. Like I feel like I'd be giving in to lots of people if I stop like talking about things that people don't really want me to talk about. Um, and I think also like having created a bit of a community for myself on social media where people are willing to like listen to what I have to say, like properly listen. Um, has created like an incredibly supportive environment for me where before like a few years ago I think it was incredibly like toxic being um, exposed like that on the internet um, but I guess like at the end of the day for me it's a lot about like feeling like I don't want to leave it for someone else to do the job I feel like it's something that's so urgent an issue that I have to get really stuck in and try and deal with it myself um, rather than sitting back and hoping that it fixes itself. And I think for me, it really is that um, urgency and the need to be personally involved and the need to personally try and fix it uh, that, yeah, keeps me going. Vanessa? Well, when it comes to me um, putting an end to climate Activism would mean letting down uh, millions of people from my community, from the African continent, from the global south and other communities that are being affected by climate change. I think that this is an issue that is a matter of life and death. And me quitting would mean that I'm choosing, like, I'm choosing death, sorry, for, for the people and for me myself. So my really my motivation and what keeps me moving is the fact that this activism is for you know uh preservation is for protecting and ensuring that people can be able to live in a community that ensures their safety their protection and that ensures that they can have access to good health and all the basic needs so it all goes back to those who are affected by the climate crisis they really keep me pushing and demanding for change because i don't want to see people continue to suffer and just watch silently because silence speaks so much when you can do something about it thank you um, there are a couple of questions that have come in about education um, since that was touched on in your talks. Um, so how do you both feel that education on climate change can be included more effectively in school curriculums? And then linked to that is how, so I guess if you could answer that with both in um, your national context, but also in the global south school uh, context of, kind of educating on climate. Mm. What's um, I think like it was 
this sounds this makes me sound slightly old but it was in like 2015 now that I learned about climate change in school and looking back it was a very strange experience because the theory of climate change was presented equally with the one where it's about like uh, natural global climate fluctuations and that sort of thing and it wasn't presented as like the only valid theory um, which I don't know if that's changed a lot because climate change is seen as well it's just like taken us back now by most people um, that doesn't like, make you sound old <laughs> like, like, not you 13 now, so I don't know if the syllabus has changed um, but I think like uh, for me, it was just very strange that climate change wasn't seen, wasn't just treated as something that was factual. Um, and I think to an extent that continued through school where the straight answer to anything was never like climate change, change like when we were talking about food shortages or terrible um, weather phenomenon and stuff like that. It was never just like, oh, this is caused by climate change. Um, so I feel like my education would have benefited a lot just by people being a lot more explicit in their discussion about climate change um, and not and like properly treating it as fact um, and I think like on a more global scale um, at least like this is linking back to Bangladesh again just because I know loads of people that live there but I feel like um, it's, it's similar stuff where people are aware of like the low scale stuff that's happening whether it's like crop failure or um, flooding or whatever, but there isn't really a narrative in a lot of countries of um, climate change like coming. And I think um, that's something that really, really needs to change. Um, and I suppose just in general, it needs to take, like, it needs to be prioritized much more than it is at the moment um, by education, considering it is something that's so urgent and so um, current, I suppose. And Vanessa, I guess there was there was another link question, which was around um, what we in the West can do to um, help on climate education in the global South. Well, um, I would give an answer in regards to what I've been doing uh, to try and you know do the education. I mean, I studied activism since it's very very um, hard to do massive strikes in my country. So I decided that I would be going in schools and talk to the students within the schools and do the strikes within the schools. And that was a form of, you know, going out to them and educating them and, you know, teaching them about the environment and, you know, the climate. And um, the other thing that I've done uh, later on, I started a project that involves installation of solar panels and, eco-friendly stoves in schools and yeah yes this this is a climate uh related uh, solution for for the community introducing them to renewable energy and uh, eco-friendly stoves so that they don't have to use uh so much firewood for preparation of their food but then it is also it has been a learning experience not just for the students, uh, but also for the teachers and for the parents, because we take these um, installations to these schools and, you know, many of them are always excited and there is a question of why, you know, why are you bringing solar energy? Why did you, why didn't you bring the usual kind of electricity that we use in Uganda? So. An answer to that is a form of education to them. Then they'll ask you, why are you, why are you using these stoves? You know, to, why are you bringing these stoves? Why can't we continue to just cook with firewood? And that brings in an answer. And uh, it, it's really, really amazing how much, you know, you educate and ask them questions, especially the, the students. And they have these answers. They know the importance of the trees. They, they really give you the answers themselves because I give them an approach whereby they actually give the answer to the question that I'm asking. And it's amazing to know how much the children know the importance of conserving the environment, but then that, 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 that hasn't been activated in them to actually realize that our planet is at stake and our future is at stake. And through this project, um, the students get this knowledge. So how the Western uh, people in the Western countries can help out, I think, wow, <laughs> I think um, how you can help, of course, 
first of all, helping those uh, who are, you know, doing the education programs in these communities, because there is always a, a, a complication of resources, reaching out to every school and reaching out to, because, you know, the country is big, it's not just the central part, you find there is an eastern part. So there is always a way that you can help out in, uh, you know, in the resources that these people use to reach out to these schools and maybe also supporting these projects in these communities, because some of these projects, uh, they're actually a form of education to the people. I forgot something else that I used, uh, I started as well, where we go to local communities and do cleaning for them, because this gives us an opportunity to talk to the, the people in those communities. We go to markets and do the cleanups, and then they'll ask, why are you doing this? Because there's always that question of why. And that is how we get the opportunity to educate these people and let them understand and you know, tell them what they can do to conserve the planet. Thank you. We have got about three minutes left, but I want to squeeze in two um, more quick ones. Um, uh, Maya Rose, I'm going to ask you this question while I go, so you can think about it while I go away and answer another one. Um, someone has asked, you talked about your work with survival and how we must amplify the voices of Indigenous peoples. How can we help to do this within and beyond the climate movement? And I'm going to take an answer to one of the questions, which is, um, which was pre-submitted, how can, how can we make employment in the charity sector more diverse? Um, so at Christian Aid, we are taking kind of active steps to try and improve diversity, not just kind of in terms of numbers within our organisation, because it's kind of relatively diverse on that front, but thinking about progression um, across different levels. Um, our CEO is a black woman, which is rare for an international development organisation in the UK, um, but we're recognising that that, doesn't, that obviously isn't going to solve everything. So in terms of our recruitment practices, we've introduced new ones where um, every panel that interviews has to be um, diverse in the, uh, not just kind of only white people. We are working with um, some people who are going to come in to do some work to look at our practices and the lived experiences of, of black and minority ethnic staff. And then Maya Rose on the Indigenous Peoples question. Um, I think there's loads of different ways to amplify Indigenous Peoples voices. Um, and I think like the first thing to do if you want to help with stuff like this is find organisations. Like I know lots of people don't like Survival International, so if you don't, then you can find a different organisation. Um, but people like that are fighting really hard to um, be a, in between with the um, conservation organisations and the communities and working to prevent stuff like them being kicked off their land, like um, poaching become com becoming commonplace, um, like I don't know various um, human rights abuses and stuff like that. So I think um, just supporting these sorts of organisations makes a massive difference. Um, but I think if you want to go a step further, if you um, look online, there's loads of different amazing um, Indigenous activists who work really hard um, to talk not just about climate change and global issues, but about um, like more local problems, like stuff like in, that's happening in their country and to their communities. Um, and through them, you'll often find uh, lots of different ways to help people. So like the two to come to mind at the moment, uh, Autumn Peltier, who's from Canada, and Helen Golinga, who's from um, Ecuador, I think. Um, and they're both amazing people. Um, and I think at the end of the day, just educating yourself about um, the Indigenous rights issues and how organisations like WWF are um, doing ter like terrible things. It doesn't mean that you um, like boycott the organisations, but it means you can like contact people and question like different campaigns and different things that they're doing um, and just trying to show that you care to the people that want your money, basically. And it, it makes a massive difference. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand over to Robbie now. Wow, thank you so much, especially Chinny for chairing this marvellous event. It's been really, really interesting um, and inspiring to hear all the different perspectives and experiences um, from, from the three of you. And I think it's definitely shown that, you know, we do need to we do need to do more to make this movement more inclusive and ensure that the actions that we take and the actions that we see benefit all people in all places around the world. Um, and I would just like to say, Vanessa, that point that you said, every activist has a story to tell, every story has a solution, and every solution has a life to save. 
I thought that that was absolutely bang on and something that I know will stay with me now for a long time and I hope that it will stay with um, all of our attendees um, watching today. So yeah, honestly, thank you so much to the three of you um, for taking the time out of your very, very busy schedules um, to be here and having this very, very important conversation um, with us today. I mean, it's definitely shown that as hope for the future, we definitely need to do better um, on this issue and alongside other um, organisations in the climate movement, you know, there's definitely, definitely more and more to be done. So yeah, another another final thank you to the three of you. Um, and I'll just say that um, tomorrow we'll be having the last um, webinar event in this mini series, um, Seen But Still Not Heard, Voices on the Youth Climate Movement. So please do join us for that. Um, it'll be about um, how to engage young people in lots of different sort of um, projects within the movement that are existing already and um, bringing along new activists um, as well. So yeah, finally, if there's any support um, that you think Hope for the Future might be able to offer you in terms of um, lobbying or working with your elected representatives on the issue of climate change, then please, please do get in touch. Um, and then just the last one point, sorry to go on, um, there will be a little feedback form on, that will pop up when you leave this session. Please, please, please do take the time um, to fill that out. It'll take a few minutes, that's all. Um, but it will make sure that the events that we do um, are as, as the best they can be. So, yeah, a big thank you to you all again. Um, and I hope to see you all and work with you all again soon.